My talk is focused on the key conceptual framework which binds together not only the contributions of our book, Entrepreneurial Universities, but also that of a special issue which predates this edited volume. The idea here is to provide you with an understanding of the framework which has helped us to organize the various contributions thematically. The book is, of course, a product of our research interests, which date back a number of years. But if we are to specify a time when the idea of the book first germinated, it has to be the conference that we organized in 2018. In January 2018, we hosted the Cosinus Conference here in Brooks. Cosinus is a network of academics and practitioners who are interested in the role of universities in different societies. The fifth iteration of the conference was hosted by Brooks Business School, and Shola and I were the co-organizers. Of course, we would not have been able to deliver what was a very successful conference without the help of Juliet and Simonetta. We had some very good speakers, including Professor John Basin, a true big hitter in innovation studies, and also Professor Mohammed Saad. Professor Saad is the founder of the Cosinas Network. He was also, incidentally, my PhD supervisor. The theme of the conference was university, industry, government linkages in a turbulent time. It seems even more appropriate now in 2020. However, at that time, we thought Trump and Brexit have made the environment more volatile. Little did we know what lies ahead. The book proposal to the publisher was, of course, based on the contributions to and from our experience from the conference. And both had the same theme, and the theme was actually uh, one of the main attractors of the proposal, as later remarked by the publisher after they had accepted the proposal. Quite soon after the conference, we came out with a special issue based on selected papers from the conference. Of course, we asked the contributors to develop them further. Um, and now in 2020, we have this edited volume coming out in September. And again, many of the contributions are based on the papers presented in Cosinus 2018. The reason for providing this short historical narrative is to point out that there are some common themes uh, running through the conference in 2018 to the, semin to the special issue in 2019 and to this edited volume in 2020. And the key themes are the system perspective on innovation, the key actors that make up the system, their interactions with each other, how those interactions affect the macro environment, and in turn, how the macro environment affects the key actors. And that understanding has shaped the structure of the book. And the book has uh, three key sections, macro, meso, and micro. And this fits in nicely with the conceptual framework that I have already referred to, and uh, which uh, now I will explain. We know that innovation and entrepreneurship are multifaceted phenomena. And what we are saying here is that it is useful to look at them from macro, meso, and micro perspectives. This approach is, of course, part of uh, the systemic view of innovation, which has evolved over time. It started in the late 1980s with the writings of Chris Freeman on, on national innovation systems. And the central idea here is that national level institutions like industry, academia, government play critical roles in developing the nation's innovative capacity. Although the roles of uh, the key actors are not particularly well defined within the concept of national innovation system, there is an implicit understanding that academia and research institutions play a lead role in developing new knowledge within the society. Some have suggested that uh, the concept of national innovation system is closely aligned with the linear model of innovation where academia research institutions do basic research, use original knowledge that is generously funded by the state. Industry comes along, takes up some of those original ideas and develop commercial applications from them. So there is this distinction between Invention and innovation, invention, which is the generation of original knowledge, is carried out by the knowledge production subsystem that is populated by universities and research institutions. Innovation, which is about commercial application, is carried out within the market subsystem led by for-profit private firms. The idea that universities should limit themselves to basic research was challenged in the 1990s by Gibbons and others 
who made the distinction between model mode one and mode two knowledge production. Mode one knowledge is basic research, research that is carried out for its own sake without any consideration for practical applications. Mode two knowledge is useful and context specific, or in other words, mode two knowledge is applied research. And Gibbons and others suggested that universities should shift to applied research, come out of their ivory tower, and make themselves more useful to the society. Even later in Early 2000 came the idea of triple helix thesis, and here the suggestion was that it is not even sufficient to focus on applied research. Universities need to take a more proactive role in the commercialization of their intellectual properties, so university spin-outs is a good thing, and universities should encourage such initiatives. All of these frameworks have their own critiques. Uh, the main critique of the national innovation system is that it lacks specificity. The suggestion of the national innovation system is that national level institutions matter. That is fine. But how they matter, that aspect is not clearly defined. The distinction made by Gibbons and others between mode one and mode two knowledge production has been critiqued by many, including me in another paper. Because it is not at all clear how one establishes which research is useful and which is not. Moreover, the empirical evidence is pretty clear. Universities that are good in basic research also excel in applied research. And the triple helix thesis, which advocates that universities should take a lead role in the commercialization of their intellectual properties, suffers from a normative bias. That is, it specifies how universities should behave, whilst uh, not giving adequate attention to how they act in reality. Our idea of the innovation triad very explicitly adopts an institutional perspective on innovation. The framework focuses our attention on the institutional environment that governs knowledge production, dissemination, and exploitation, and identifies the key actors. So we are concerned not with uh, the whole macro environment, but with that part of the environment that specializes in the production, dissemination, and exploitation of knowledge. One of the actors that make up the innovation triad is the knowledge entrepreneur. Knowledge entrepreneurs convert ideas, concepts into products and services that are put into societal use. And typically, but not always, they are private for profit entrepreneurs. And a knowledge entrepreneur specializes in exploitation of knowledge for financial and or social rewards. A good example is AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is currently collaborating with the University of Oxford to produce the COVID-19 vaccine. And the signs are very encouraging. We may indeed have uh, Oxford vaccine in the near future. And this is typically how knowledge entrepreneurs work. They work in close collaboration with knowledge incubators but they also have the necessary resources and capabilities in-house to take advantages of the opportunities that arise in the environment. And as I have said before, not all knowledge entrepreneurs are for profit firm. Consider an organization like Oxfam, hugely innovative in terms of its organizational model, yet uh, it is a charity. Another actor within the triad is the knowledge incubator. And knowledge incubators deal with knowledge, unsurprisingly. They create new knowledge, acts as repositories of existing knowledge, and disseminate knowledge. Typically, but not always, they are universities, research institutes, think tanks, and learned societies. And an excellent example is Oxford Brookes University, maybe also the other university down the road. But not all knowledge incubators are conventional in universities. So, for example, Schneider Electric has an in-house training center, which they call Energy University. And that is also a form of knowledge incubator. And last but not least, we have the rule makers who set up policies, establish the rules of the game. And typically, but not always, they are government bodies. Like in the UK, we have the UKRI. But also you have the associations of knowledge incubators and knowledge entrepreneurs like uh, in the academic sector in the UK, we have Universities UK and this association also influence rule making. Uh, a very good example of such rules is the REF 2021, which we are all well familiar with. 
and which regulates the research activities of knowledge incubators. And the way these rules have come about is through interactions of various players. So the structure of the book now should be even more clearer to you. At the macro level, we are referring to formal rules and informal norms of behavior. At the meso level, we are looking at interactions between the KEs, KIs, and the RMs. And at the micro level, the focus is on the dynamics of specific knowledge entrepreneurs and knowledge incubators. And uh, that ends this presentation. Thank you.